Uh, young leaders who are living at the intersection of many different places. Um, one of the gifts of the time that we are living in is that because of technology, uh, we are able to see these leaders lifted up in new and different ways. Uh, and Blair Amani is one of those leaders. Uh, she lives at the intersection of black, queer, and Muslim uh, in those borderlands that Sally Howard was preaching about uh, this morning. Uh, and she has been an author, a mental health advocate, um, and a powerful speaker for the incredible life that happens at the intersections that we have in society. Um, she has written this book, Modern Her Story, Stories of Women and Non-Binary non People, Rewriting History. It's one of these books that you pick it up thinking, oh, I'm just going to read one or two of these, and you end up reading all of them, and there goes an hour or two. And it's some of the best hour or two you've ever spent in your life. It's an incredible book. Uh, she'll be selling them and signing them out on the lawn after, uh, after the forum. Um, but right now, Blair, I'd just love to bring you up here, and um, I'm going to sit down, and can we welcome to the Rector's Forum, uh, Blair Amani. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for foregoing a little bit of breakfast for a little bit of my talk. Um, I'm also happy to do uh, questions afterward as well. Um, I think that part of doing a forum is to have you know, an engaging dialogue. Um, and I think this is just a beautiful opportunity. The first time I came to All Saints Church um, was in, tw in 2004. My parents are here in the audience along with my aunt and uncle. Um, they'll take questions as well. <laughs> Um, and uh, I remember it being a conversation uh, even prior to Prop 8 around same-sex couples and about equality and about um, really honoring Jesus in this way where, you know, living in Christ does not mean uh, shutting out your neighbor, does not mean judging your neighbor, it means loving your neighbor, and it means doing that in action, which means passing legislation that honors thy neighbor. Um, and so in 2004, we were coming to church here, and it was one of the first places I had been in that was explicitly um, pro-LGBT and in a space of faith. And I often reference those teachings that I had growing up. Um, I'm a Muslim today, I converted in 2015, but we are all siblings of the book, as I like to say, Abrahamic cousins. Um, and I often speak to people about what it means to be uh, a queer person of faith, and I you know, had the uh, honor of growing up in spaces like All Saints that made room for people to be their full selves and to have access to God's love. Because too often today, conversations about faith exclude people and say, you have access to God's love. You do not. You do. You do not. And that's not our uh, decision to make as human beings. Um, that's God's decision to make. Um, and I am of the belief that we are all God's children and we all have access to God's wonderful love. Um, I often lead chants, and we're gonna do a little, you know, we do some call and repeats in church as well. Um, I'm gonna say, my God, and I would like you all to say, does not discriminate. So we'll do that a couple times. My God. My God. My God. Beautiful. Um, and I'm also in, an ambassador today for Muslims for Progressive Values, um, which uh, your church is so uh, kindly and generously making a donation to in exchange for having me speak, which I really appreciate. It helps us do uh, the important work of making sure that people across faith traditions um, feel welcomed and loved uh, and bathed in God's light. Uh, and we have a chant that we do as well, no hate in my faith. And actually there's the no hate in my faith pledge, um, which I will look up, you can text in the number, pull it up now. Smartphones are, I don't know what y'all did before smartphones, honestly. Okay, so um, the text in code for that, and essentially what the no, faith, no Hate in My Faith pledge is, is against things like conversion therapy. Um, many of you might know that conversion therapy is only outlawed in about 12 states in the United States. Um, and for those of you who are blessed not to even know what conversion therapy is, it's this horrible practice where uh, religious texts are interpreted against and weaponized against people who embody difference, people who are of the LGBTQ community. And essentially it is to, quote, pray the gay away, as you might know more colloquially. The harmful thing is that in religious traditions like in Islam or in Mormonism, it is seen as something that is inherent to the faith, and so it's not even considered to be conversion therapy when people go through that process. Um, but it's also things like rooting out anti-Semitism within faith traditions, uh, etc. 
So um, if you want to pull out your phones, I know they might be silence, um, you can text the word UNITY to 52886. I'll call it out a few more times. And you can take the No Hate in My Faith pledge, and that adds your name to a wonderful wall of people um, who have also taken this pledge. And it's something that I've been encouraging people to do uh, around the world as I've given these talks. And it's something really important to say, hey, my faith isn't going to be used against anyone. There's going to be no hate in my faith. So again, that number is 52886, and the word is unity. I'll do it again at the end of the talk, just in case your phone's turning on. Uh, I know the, the struggle there. <laughs> so recently, I had the joy of being, uh, well, dubious joy, I suppose, of being at the Supreme Court. Um, uh, for those of you who know, for those of you who don't, right now the Supreme Court is deliberating on Title VII uh, of the Civil Rights Act, which uh, defines discrimination uh, against people of a certain of sex as prohibited. But presently, the Supreme Court is deciding whether or not that extends to people uh, on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. This doesn't just mean that trans people and queer people are under attack. It means that anybody who doesn't uh, fit into the definition of what a man is or what a woman is or somebody in between is are, un are uh, liable to be um, fired from their job and denied their livelihood. I gave a speech on the steps of the Supreme Court talking about how, uh, how harmful it is that people weaponize these religious texts against their loved ones and against their neighbors. Um, and I was called to uh, remember the words of a dear friend of mine, J. Mace III, who said, uh, we all understand that when God, you know, in the story of Genesis, God created the day and God created the night. But there's no mention of dawn or dusk or sunrise or sunset. Yet we don't go and protest in the streets because sunrise, sunset, dusk, and dawn haven't been specifically named. We know these to be God's creations as well. And it was so beautiful, uh, beautifully put to me that uh, I wanted to repeat it here today because LGBTQ people were absolutely present in the times of Jesus and the Old Testament um, throughout religious texts, religious traditions. My religious text is the Quran. We are present there. We might not be named explicitly. There might not be the language to define us explicitly, but uh, what we do see is that people who have hate in their hearts will willingly use those texts against us. And I think it's important for us to take that back and to say, you will not have power over me and over my soul and over my relationship with God because I am the sunset and I am the sunrise. And though I'm not listed explicitly in these texts, I am still under God's love. So that's something to meditate on today. Um, some people that are simultaneously written out of religious traditions and of historical texts are the people in my book, um, Modern History. Um, I'm here on the cover. My mom suggested, my mom right there, suggested I put myself on the cover because Oprah puts herself on the cover of all of her magazines. Um, and so why not me? <laughs> um, on the cover as well are several different people who I have had the joy of meeting in my various um, travels and um, movement working. Um, I was, uh, let me tell you a little bit about me before I get into this actually. Uh, it's a fun story. Um, so I was born and raised Christian right here in Pasadena. I was born in Cedar sinai Hospital in LA, y'all know it. Um, and I went to St. Mark's Church, Episcopal Church, um, or St. Mark's School for elementary school, and then we moved to San Marino. Um, and I grew up in just this environment that was just very affirming. Um, we were the only black people in the neighborhood of San Marino, except for um, one judge who lives in San Marino as well. And so I kind of grew up like there was a magnifying glass on me, just feeling like I'm a little bit different. Folks who have parents who are divorced might feel that way. Oh, I'm the only one who has divorced parents. Oh, I'm the only person who speaks Spanish at my school. We've all come from a place of feeling like we were the only one. Uh, at the same time, I grew up when uh, Senator Barack Obama would later become President Barack Obama. And as the only black kid at the school, I was the spokesperson um, for every parent who had any kind of inkling of curiosity um, about what young black America was thinking, which was a lot of pressure, um, but I think I rose to the occasion sufficiently. It helped me with my public speaking, it helped me with my impromptu speaking, certainly. Um, but the question, what does young black America think about Barack Obama, was one that I answered many, many times a day. Um, and I, was, I had the, um, the 
uh, honor of being able to meet President Barack Obama on two occasions, one when he was fundraising here in Pasadena with my father, um, and then another time at the Obama summit just recently, 10 years apart, um, and I was able to tell him that <laughs> he was personally responsible for my um, speaking prowess and my public speaking ability because people were so curious about him and they wanted to know what the community thought, and I became that representative. And look, I'm talking here today, um, and it's part of my career. Um, I went to school at Louisiana State University, which was a culture shock. Uh, Louisiana State University is in the deep south. It's in Baton Rouge. Um, growing up in Southern California, you can really get into the mindset that racism is over, especially when Obama's president. It was talk about this post-racial society, and I was definitely drinking the Kool-Aid when it came to that. I was like, it'll be fine. I'll go down south. It'll be cool. Um, my grandmother, um, Marlene Chabonet, on the other hand, who had come from New Orleans in the Great Migration, which is the subject of my next book, which I'll talk about as well, um, she was freaking out, and rightfully so. Uh, she was, you know, trying to disabuse me of this delusion I had that racism was over and everything would be fine. She wanted to prepare me. And is that not what we want to do for all of our children? Prepare them for the world and the realities of the world, whether those are good things or bad things, just so we are prepared. Um, I didn't listen. I was 18 at the time. You know how we are. Um, and <laughs> it wasn't too long ago. I'm 25 now. But it was just um, this culture clash for me where I had grown up with people like Terrence Roberts, who lives here in Pasadena, one of the Little Rock Nine, people who at the age of 15 volunteered with Dr. Martin Luther King to say, I will put my life on the line for progress. I will put my faith into action for the benefit of all humanity. People who went through the, saw the worst of humanity, but also the best of humanity. Um, when I interviewed him when I was 12 years old, I had it in my mind that I could change the world too. Now I move to the deep south, and I'm no longer the only black kid. There's finally people who look like me, but there's not a lot of people who think like me. And it was one time when I sat in church, I'm sorry, not in church, um, it was kind of like church, it was political science class, which can get like church, um, <laughs> with um, a friend of mine who I'll call Stephen. And Stephen was telling me about, um, you know, asking me how what I thought about gay people. I didn't know that he was trying to come out to me at that time, but I just kind of waxed poetic about how cool it is to be gay and how, you know, affirming it is and how all the coolest fashion designers I know are gay and, you know, just kind of um, being a Southern California girl, like, oh yeah, and this is great about being gay and just go going on and on and on. And it was so foreign to him that anyone would say this. And so I, you know, kind of recoiled and I said, oh, you're not a homophobe, are you? And he was like, no, I'm gay. I've just never heard anybody speak that highly of gay people in my life. And that was shocking to me. I knew it existed, but I felt like it was something far away, something that happened in black and white, not something that was happening in the present. We became really close friends, Stephen and I. We actually worked at the same law firm later on. He got me that job, which was dope. Um, but he told me about how he was put in conversion therapy, and I had never heard of that before. He told me about how his parents got him a therapist and how they made him go to church and how that became a place of trauma and of pain, not of joy, uh, joyous rejoice for God's love. It became a place where he was hurt and where we uh, text was weaponized against him. And I did my best to assure him that there was nothing wrong with him. But when religious leaders tell you that there is, it's very difficult for you to come back from that. And I think, you know, being a, I'm bisexual, being a person who is queer and didn't grow up in those harmful spaces, it's very hard for me to uh, speak about God in a way that is uplifting because I first have to acknowledge the harms and the traumas that people have come through. So later, Stephen eventually came out and he graduated from Louisiana State University with me and attended the Lavender graduation ceremony specifically for LGBT students. But between now and between um, then, those two points of us having that first conversation in poli-sci class and graduation, we had worked together in so many different ways, whether it was holding, uh, organizing protests. Now, the great thing about Louisiana State University is that you know, I had gone to Pasadena schools, which are impeccable schools, and Louisiana State University was not as academically rigorous as even PCC here, which is a phenomenal school. Um, and so I had a lot of free time. I went to class on Tuesday and Thursday, and on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I was partying, just kidding. I'm very boring. <laughs> My mom was actually encouraging me to party more. Um, but on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I was teaching sex ed in all parts of Louisiana and in parts of Texas in my little um, bright orange uh, Honda Fit. I was driving around to the Capitol, which was right there in Baton Rouge, and I was lobbying. I was meeting with people in their place of worship, people who passed legislation that was very harmful. 
In fact, some of the cases that are being heard at the Supreme Court around Title VII are coming from places like Louisiana, places where abortion is so stigmatized that people, that young people, as young as six years old, will learn what an abortion is before they even learn their alphabet. <laughs> it's really bizarre, and I've seen it. Um, I've seen the harms of what stigma and what ignorance can do. And so it was kind of in that uh, culture shock where I felt so empowered, and I was trying to be Angela Davis so hard, I had an afro then as well, um, where I decided to devote my life to spreading education and love and tolerance to combat the ignorance and hatred and shame that was so prevalent in not just Louisiana, but in all parts of the world. So that brings me to my book. Um, oh, and then also I converted, I converted to Islam in 2015. Um, my parents went on that journey with me. Um, and so it was just really beautiful to see how I could reclaim faith in a way that was personal to me. How I could talk to God in a way that worked for me um, and not for someone else. So um, in the midst of those travels, in the midst of those, those journeys, I was able to meet um, most of the women who are covered on this book, especially those who are still living. So first we have Alison Renville. I met her at the Obama summit, which I mentioned, and she was sitting in the back of the room. And she was just kind of you know, brooding, meditating, and very quiet. She was in her tribal dress, she's Native American, and she was getting increasingly frustrated, and you could kind of see it on her face. I'm someone who's very, tries to be very aware of the room. I'm the kind of person that sits with somebody who doesn't have anyone to sit with. So I went and I sat back with her. And she was talking to me, and we were kind of whispering as Dolores Huerta was talking, which was dope, uh, just like right there. Um, and she was telling me how frustrating it is that people are talking about diversity and inclusion, but no one got up and spoke to her. No one would even talk to her. She's Native American, she speaks English because of colonization, so there shouldn't be any language issue that anyone's thinking about, but people had this mental barrier of she's different, she's in her tribal dress. So I encouraged her to speak up, and she did. She called out every soul in that room and said, none of you have done what this woman, me, has done next to me. Make yourself open to me. Why is that? How are we going to talk about inclusion and not even speak to our neighbors? So I thought that was really powerful. What she's doing now is running for office in South Dakota, which is a really amazing. Um, she's kind of mobilized and taken that change um, that she felt like she caught in that room and tried to spread it widely. So that's Alison Renville. You can read her story. The next person, uh, she's so young. And it's interesting, in the publishing world, people are very shy, especially when it comes to historical texts, of depicting people when they're young. Because what if they change? Well, I hope they change. I hope they grow up to full people, you know, full adults, and I hope they continue to do great things. But I think it's important to have a living history, so that way we have the stories of what people's lives were like, um, so we don't end up what we have in the Bible, which is like this kind of blackout period between Jesus' youth. You know, the teen years of Jesus are kind of like, what happened? Um, we can only imagine. But with Mari Kopany, uh, who at the age of, I believe, eight years old, and it's in the book, verify there, wrote a letter to President Obama now, Mari Kopany lives in Flint, Michigan. And as you probably know, there's a crisis in Flint, Michigan, as there is in many other areas of the United States, where the lead pipes were, the water that went through the lead pipes was not properly treated, so it started to leach the lead into the pipes, causing lead poisoning in school children. And it wasn't until one rogue doctor decided to test the blood of the school children that the uh, state decided to finally listen and say, we have to declare an emergency. Because prior to that, they were saying, no, drink your water, drink your water. And the residents of Flint would turn on their water faucets and see this brown, smelly water coming through the pipes and would question the faith they had in their government. And so there's widespread corruption there. And as little Mari Kopany, who was eight years old, kept seeing this, she, like Greta Thunberg after her, were thinking, and actually they're around the same age now, were thinking, there is this insurmountable evil that I am presented with. What am I going to do about it? So she took pen to paper and she wrote a letter. And she wrote a letter and she sent it to President Obama, calling out what was happening and saying, please come bear witness to what I'm experiencing. This is, this is horrible. And even her parents, you know, as, as you want to protect your children from the world, you also want to prepare them for the possibility that this, you know, high and mighty elected official might not respond. But luckily, even with her parents' uh, reluctance and reservations, they sent the letter off and they got a response. And not only did they get a response, President Obama came to Flint, Michigan, and it completely changed the trajectory of that story. Because there was an eight-year-old little girl forcing America to bear witness to what was happening to her community. She couldn't play on the slip and slide. She couldn't take a bubble bath. She couldn't 
cook Thanksgiving dinner without using hundreds of bottles of water. And she's still living that life there in Flint, Michigan. She can't just up and leave. And so she continues to raise awareness about that. And so um, I have her on the book as well because her story is important too. The stories of women and non-binary people rewriting history also means the folks who might not look be, be seen as old enough to even make history, but they sure are. Um, then we have Kat Black, who is an amazing YouTuber who documented her transition as a, trans, as a black trans woman um, and did that on social media and really opened up the eyes of so many people. Um, one of her viral videos that I highly recommend, and you're gonna wanna watch it as soon as I say the title, uh, was about Rachel Dolezal, who, for those of you who are blessed to not know, um, was a woman, a white woman, who masqueraded as a black woman in, I believe, uh, Washington, and took le positions of leadership and really kind of edged out a lot of other black women in really important situations. And then when that story hit, her family had outed her and finally said, yeah, she's not black. Um, we have childhood pictures of her and she's blonde as blue eyed as, you know, anyone else. And uh, after that story happened, um, it was happening right as Caitlyn Jenner was coming out as a woman. And people were saying, well, if race is a construct and gender is a construct, then both should be fine. Well, it gets a lot deeper into that. And I remember being so fortunate and so grateful for Cat Black because I didn't have the vocabulary to articulate the conversation, but it became so dismissive of the trans people in my gender studies classroom. And all I needed to do was put Cat Black on the screen. And she broke it down um, in this really beautiful way. And it showed me the power of social media and how the people who are getting online and who are having these really difficult and nuanced conversations, they deserve to be honored in history books as well. Then we have Alyssa Thompson, who's depicted here in her wheelchair. She was born with osteogenesis imperfecta, which is brittle bone disease known uh, colloquially. She also has dwarfism. Um, and she really just struck me as an amazing person who uh, wanted to talk about disability, uh, which is what your church is doing here so powerfully, talking about faith, accessible faith and what it means to be able to access a faith space. Um, for those of you who don't know, oftentimes ramps and elevators that are necessary for people who have different mobility needs, they can't even get into the spaces because there's um, protection clause where the ADA often doesn't apply to historical spaces like churches. Um, and so with Melissa Thompson, um, what was powerful was just asking her when we did the illustration of her. We have portraits of most of the people in the book, but for her I wanted to know, do you want to be depicted with your chair? And she said that that was the first time anyone had asked her. And so it really made me think, as a custodian of history, what does it mean to honor people's stories and to honor the way people want to be seen? And I think that's crucial. Then we have Marsha P. Johnson, who we have to thank for the entire LGBTQ rights movement, her and Sylvia Rivera. Um, to this year is the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, which was an uprising um, in 1969, right as America was saying, we're going to the moon and we're going to be the most progressive you know, uh, place on earth. You still have COINTELPRO happening against the black community. You still see poverty, you still see oppression, and you're still seeing the policing um, and harm against the LGBTQ community. What happened during that night, people make it seem very nebulous, but I was able to uh, meet with folks who actually experienced that evening. The police had come into a gate club and the Stonewall Inn, which is still standing, and they said, empty your cash registers, we're taking your money. Because the alternative is, you don't, you refuse, and we out all of you to your friends and family and you, you lose your jobs. This is 1969. And while there were people who were out, there were so many people who were closeted because the social climate was just so restrictive. And so, that evening was uh, girls' night. So there were a lot of drag queens who were there, a lot of trans women who were there, like Sylvia Rivera. And Sylvia Rivera, amongst other folks, said, we have gone through so much trauma and so much pain, being homeless, living on the streets of New York, and being criminalized. Just like today, when trans women walk around in the streets, people assume that they are soliciting, people assume that they are sex workers, and there's stigma against that, and they become criminalized. So these people had experienced that from the age of 10 on up. And so they said, you want our money? Take it. And they started to throw handfuls of coins and quarters at the police. And that incited into a riot. And that lasted four days long. Right as America is saying that we're on the precipice of equality and on freedom and on progressivism. These folks said, we're not going to take it anymore. And they started to throw these coins. And it really shifted the movement from, we're just like you, except gay, to, no, we are different and that is important. And we're not going to acquiesce to respectability or to police violence and we're going to speak up. And the fact that I learned about Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson in college made me furious because these people created the very 
language that describes people like me, like bisexuality and the affirmation of bisexuality and of queer identity and of LGBTQ liberation. They created that infrastructure. And so the fact that I didn't even know the people who created that movement frustrated me to no end. So that's the very first story you learn about in the book. And that was my way of trying to right the wrongs of history. Next we have Issa Rae, who has an amazing show on HBO called Insecure. Um, and she is just so powerful. She went to college at a time when YouTube was being created, and she used YouTube to her benefit. She really kind of flipped the script on what it meant to be a black woman creator. Um, she's also created something called a, uh, a black woman sketch comedy show, and it has the article A in the front to say, this isn't the only one. There should be many, many more. Then you have me, told you about myself already, and Lorraine Hansberry. Um, What's funny about the Lauren Hansberry image is so she was the first black woman to have a show on Broadway and she told the story of her family. But she did it in a way and at a time where a lot of the folks who were white in her community were not able to even know about what's going on because of segregation. So it really kind of quenched this curiosity um, between the black and the white communities. But what's funny is that we have her holding a pen because she was a playwright, but it was definitely a cigarette before. But it's a kid's book, so th that. <laughs> Um, and the person who did all of these illustrations is Monique Lay, who's a first generation uh, Vietnamese immigrant from Virginia. And she and I connected on social media. And that kind of brings me to the end of my talk um, because the way that I was able to connect with Monique is something that I think is so powerful. When we come to faith spaces and we come to church, we are sitting and communing with people from all different walks of life. You don't know what your neighbor's talent is unless they you know, bring that up to you. There's no really career day at work or at church, but that's a good idea. So we don't really always know what's going on in people's lives. And so I connected with her because she was doing these beautiful illustrations of her own style spin on various cartoon traditions. And I thought it was brilliant, so I reached out to her. Um, and I asked her if she'd be willing to part, you know, take part in this journey with me. And so at the age of 19, she became a published illustrator with my book. Um, and we've worked together you know, since. And um, we're depicted here together on the front cover. Um, and I just think it's so powerful that you can come together with people from different religious traditions. She's Buddhist. Um, I'm Muslim. Um, our editor is Jewish. Our book agent is Catholic. And we all came together as women and as powerful people to create this important project. So it's not just about the book and about the stories in this book, but it's about what it means and what it represents to be somebody who is disrupting who is a publisher and who tells stories. I don't have a master's degree or a PhD. Um, I, tell, I, I write my books using dictation software on my phone, and that's okay. What it means to be an author is changing. What it means to be somebody who makes history is changing. And I think doing that from a context of faith, knowing that the people you are around come from different walks of life and that you can love them and honor them is crucial. And so that that's what guides me. Um, thank you so much. And I encourage you to buy a copy of the book and I'll be uh, signing them later. But I also want to make space for questions if we have time. Thank you. We, we have about 10 minutes, so um, questions. Uh, we'll start over here. Hey, my name is Martin, thank you. Um, the question I have is, um, I converted to a different religion, and I'm just curious what your conversion, if you remember your point of conversion and why you converted to something other than Christianity. Oh, definitely. Um, and my parents had always been, and I think still very much are, open to different religious traditions and talking about like the contributions of different religious traditions. But I remember, you know, this kind of veil being placed, I mean, not to make puns, but this veil being placed over Islam, LOL, hijab, anyway. Um, this veil being placed over Islam is something that was very taboo and untouchable, something that was imbued with terroristic and violent qualities. And that's absolutely not true. Uh, Islam is a religion of love, as you all know and understand. Um, and so I was very curious about it. And I started to learn actually about the partition of India and Pakistan um, and Bangladesh and how the uh, kind of coalescence of uh, culture, religion, race, and colonization 
um, forced people to have to make their own way in life and how much it paralleled with what happened in the United States um, with segregation and slavery. And so I really became interested in this. And as I was doing that, we were also organizing uh, for Black Lives Matter and holding vigils. And one of the only spaces that would allow us to have a space was the Islamic Center at Louisiana State University. So I was kind of already in, you know, on the turf. Um, and it really spoke to me that um, it wasn't, it was one of the spaces in this very kind of racialized South. You know, people always say, uh, or it's often said, especially amongst race historians, that the most segregated day in, in the South is Sunday. And oftentimes, church doesn't look like how it looks here. It's not accessible. It's not racially inclusive. In fact, uh, in the Baptist church in particular, and unfortunately, um, Christianity was used against black people, and it was reclaimed in um, the black uh, liberation tradition. Um, and so with that complicated history, as we were organizing for Black Lives Matter, a lot of churches felt timid to say, we're going to bring these people in, and we're going to make space for them, because they were still healing these wounds. Um, and so as I was in the mosque, it was one of the first times anywhere that I had been where people didn't ask me what race I was first. Um, maybe that's because they assumed, maybe because they didn't care, but I really felt welcome. Um, and it was also one of the times where I just was like at my wit's end in terms of being burnt out. Um, there's this thing called activist burnout, which I'm sure many of you have experienced, especially after this most recent election, where you feel like you're doing your absolute level best, but it's not enough and it's not changing as much as you want to see change. Um, and that's part of why the stories in this book in particular are ones that show you the arc of someone's life and how parts of their life help them to contribute to a movement. Um, but I didn't have that yet. And so it felt like a, I was coming into a calm from a storm. And I think whatever religious tradition you practice or not, having a time and a space where you can meditate on life and look at something higher than yourself is so crucial. And so that became something that I wanted to revisit over and over and over again. Um, so converting to Islam is actually really easy. Um, you say the Shahada, which is similar to the Lord's Prayer, um, and you uh, basically surrender yourself to God and to the five pillars of Islam. And so that's what I did um, after about a year of studying. And it just became something that was really fulfilling for me. Um, and I've kind of become this, uh, you know, I was kind of already on my way to being a public figure, but now I was this Muslim public figure, and there was so much intrigue and uh, curiosity around that that it kind of put me on this, like I said, really interesting trajectory where I'm able to meet and speak with so many people and have community with so many people who are different from me, who appear to be the same as me, but have from different lives. Um, so it's been really fulfilling, and I do feel like I'm closer to God, but that was just the path that I chose. Thank you for your question. Um, <clears throat> my name is Mark, and I grew up in an evangelical fundamentals home. Um, <clears throat> and I was raised that the, the Bible was God's truth, and there's no mistakes, there's no errors. It's literally God's word. Um, and, you know, I've gotten past that now um, by doing a lot of outside research on my journey and finding out that that wasn't true and that there was a lot of passages and, and verses and so forth that were um, you know, uh, changed or deleted or added onto and bias and everything else that goes into an ancient uh, book. How do you deal with um, difficult Muslim texts in the Quran? Um, how, how do you deal with or um, fundamentals Islam, like I have to deal, I still deal with it because my family is still, and some of my friends too, are still involved in the fundamentalist evangelical church. So how, how do you deal with the text in the Quran and how do you deal with, with those real strict fundamentalist Muslims? Thank you, that's a really important that's question. Important question. Um, I was really um, just so, empowered to be connected with my mentor, Ani Zanabelt, who is a woman imam, who is a queer affirming imam. Um, I would love her to speak here as well. She's amazing. Um, and really just know that she didn't place qualifiers on who I was as a person of faith. 
Um, but also understanding that the, the reason why radicalization, for example, um, happens not just within Islam, but also within you know, Christian sects is because people believe that their religious text and their, their lifestyle and their faith is incompatible with modern society or what they understand modern society to be. And when you have those two things included with poverty and vulnerability, you have people who swoop in and say, I understand you, young kid. Why don't you join up with me? And whether that's ISIS or the KKK, it's very harmful to mass populations. And so the way that I deal with that is, you know, there's one um, kind of interpretation called defensive theology. And that's when you have those, you know, difficult conversations with people. And so I engage with that oftentimes. Um, but I get messages on, the daily, on a daily basis from different people who are on different um, levels of understanding. Sometimes I get um, messages that are very antagonistic. Um, sometimes, uh, most of the time, uh, well, not even most of the time, but sometimes they're written uh, with like low levels of English. So sometimes I just get gay, Muslim, question mark. And I go, great, um, what do I do with that? <laughs> sometimes I get more nuanced questions like, hey, I don't want to offend you, but I really, I'm struggling with this myself. How do I? And they are like more thoughtful. Sometimes I get stories from people who are friends of folks who are queer and Muslim and want to help them because they see them suffering. Um, so I created a frequently asked questions page on my website because I thought, what, is, what does a company do when they get the same question over and over again? And so I created that. It's blairimani.com forward slash FAQ, and it kind of talks about these things. But I was also really excited that um, on, July, on June 1st, to bring in Pride Month and also Ramadan, I gave a TED Talk about what it means to be queer and Muslim. And my mom gave me the great line, which killed in the audience. Um, in my, so people always ask me, how do I reconcile my religious identity and my sexual orientation? And my mom says, we don't reconcile identities in this house. We reconcile bank accounts. And people like erupted into laughter. It was a great one, mom. Um, shout out to my mom for her great you know, wit. Um, and so they named the, the TED Talk Queer and Muslim and Nothing to Reconcile. And I thought that was so important because in the times when Prophet Muhammad or when um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were writing these texts, there was no word for homosexuality. It was just a, an expression of love in humanity. There was no words for criminalizing acts of love, uh, acts of consensual intimacy. But you know, when we start to see colonization, that's when we start to see, especially Victorian colonization, these Victorian ideas, these very puritanical ideas, start to seep in to the Muslim world. And so in that talk, I talk about how um, Christians, gay Christians and gay Jewish people would come to Islamic countries to feel free. And that's something that's mind-boggling for people to understand today. But it was because it was more permissive. Islam is a very reserved religion. It's very um, deep into modesty. So what you do in your own home is, in fact, not up for discussion, as long as you're not harming anyone. It's all about intent. Um, it's part of the reason why people cover, because it is you know, my life, um, not for everyone to see. And so I talk about that. Um, and of the five countries that were not colonized in the way that other Islamic countries were uh, in terms of the Victorian ideals, those five countries do not have laws on the books that are uh, anti-LGBT. So there's things called sodomy laws that define what sex acts are and then define those as something that should be criminalized. Those don't exist in the five Islamic countries that weren't colonized, so it is from colonization. So I think history and knowing where you came from is crucial. I remember feeling so liberated when I learned about the Council of Trent and the creation of the King James Bible, and I was like, oh, okay, so people edited it? Um, and the final thing I'll say is that I really find strength making connections between pop culture and um, religiosity, because if we look at Christianity as a giant fandom, the way that we look at Pokemon as giant fandom, but maybe a fandom for Jesus, you know, then we can really understand that sometimes people get their hands on you know, an episode of Star Trek, and they will make their own interpretation. And you'll be like, I saw none of that. What are you talking about? Or they'll see Pokemon, some Pokemon episode, and they'll be like, I don't understand that. And sometimes people get the religious text, and they make their own interpretation. Sometimes it's for good, and sometimes it's for bad. Um, but you have to know that there are two sides of it, and that um, there's a way out. Um, and the way that I came to that conclusion is that I dressed up for Comic-Con as Geordie LaForge, um, and people were telling me that there's no Muslims in Star Trek. And I was like, well, Star Trek's not real, so I don't know what you're talking about. But it made me realize that those people are using their own bias and where they come from and applying it to that source material in the same way somebody who has never met a gay person will read the, the, uh, the Bible and then apply it to somebody in maybe a positive or negative way or they might have questions. So I try to go forward with love, with education, and with tolerance and giving people the benefit of the doubt. Um, and when that fails, I send them my FAQ page link. So I'm not doing that emotional labor, but I think that um, 
at the end of the day, people are more prone to be good than they want to do harm. And once you make people realize that what they're doing is harmful, they want to change. Um, but it does, uh, what's important and what I always tell people is that it's not always our job to do that. So if it comes to a place of pain for you where you can no longer engage with somebody who's being harmful to you, take a step back, take a breather, um, and really make sure that you're around people who are nourishing your spirit and not leeching from it. Thank you. Well, thank you so Can we give Blair just a huge hand? Thank you so much. And we hope you'll come back again when you're visiting home again. It is, you are such a gift. Um, BlairMani.com, that is also up on our Facebook page, so you can link to it there. Um, you're going to be out front yes. signing books. And so I live in Pasadena now, so I can come back. Well, you live here now. I thought you were in New York. Oh, great. Well, yeah. keep coming back. Yeah, we'd love to have you here. Um, and just thank you one, uh, again, just everyone, can we give her a hand one more time? Thank you.